So I'm going to talk a little bit about our um, sort of meandering path in tissue engineering, actually, um, starting off in uh, focusing on stem cells and ending up in, in the immune system, so the immune system and regenerative medicine. So as you all are familiar with, um, tissue and organ loss remains a global challenge. Um, and while organ donation is increasing, um, and we do have synthetic implants and options for some tissue loss and organs, such as a hip or a knee implant, um, there's still great desire to have a, a real tissue substitute. So the field of tissue engineering evolved to provide this solution. Um, in, 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 in essence, using a three-pronged approach uh, where you have a biomaterial scaffold serving as a three-dimensional framework for new tissue growth and also as a framework for uh, stem cells or just regular cells from a biopsy um, and various factors that might be used to stimulate that tissue growth. Um, and what we noticed when I started is that there was a lot of excitement for the field, but there wasn't that much translation. So we were very interested in, in moving something forward to the clinic um, as early as possible, while at the same time studying the basics of uh, stem cells. So one of the key aspects that will come up throughout is what are the key therapeutic factors? If we want to translate, right, and if we want to build the best technology, what are, what are the levers that we want to uh, move up and down to actually promote tissue growth, and how might they be different in um, different scenarios, different people? So our focus um, was on, on um, cartilage, so uh, initially. So this is a tissue that uh, lines the surface of your joints. Um, and unfortunately, when it's damaged, it can't repair very well. And so I mentioned he and, he, hip and knee implants, um, and those are widely used. But ultimately, we really do want a biological solution. So when I started um, 20 years ago, it was about the time when stem cells were, um, you know, quite, quite, um, you know, rising in, in their focus of uh, research. So this, this picture here of um, the mesenchymal stem cell was something that was pretty much shown at every conference when I was starting out. And um, this was, of course, particularly interest for us looking at cartilage. So, you know, we don't want to take a biopsy. Can we take these cells and make cartilage? Um, and so we built materials to, to um, do that. And then um, there was the embryonic stem cells. And so we spent a lot of time trying to understand how can we take an embryonic stem cell and consistently get it to make cartilage um, and actually also bone and adipose. And finally, the last stem cell um, type that um, um, we looked at were the induced pluripotent cells. Um, Oki, Oki John um, did some work with bone, making osteoclasts and osteoblasts um, from iPS cells. But it's been quite a while since we've worked with stem cells in the lab, and I want to um, tell you a little bit more about that. So as we were looking at translating um, technologies, we wanted to take the information that we learned from our stem cell work. So these synthetic hydrogels in which we would encapsulate cells, we could take chondrocytes, the cells that make cartilage, adult stem cells, embryonic stem cells, and provide various signals to induce that tissue growth. Um, but at the same time, we wanted to get something in the clinic right away. It was clear that delivering cells, living cells, stem cells to patients broadly was going to be hard. So um, we wanted to start off with something that connected with current surgical practice. So in order to translate um, what we learned from the hydrogels in the stem cell work to the clinic, we ended up working with microfracture, a procedure where you essentially take a pick and uh, drill down into the bone, cause some bleeding, mobilize cells. And the real goal is mobilizing endogenous, um, um, endogenous um, um, progenitor cells. So this was the basic paradigm. We had to develop an adhesive to help hold the hydrogel in place. So we paint that adhesive in there, um, perform the microfracture, and then you have the hydrogel. And you can see that essentially that hydrogel is enriching um, and, and concentrating the, the stuff that comes up from that drilling process 
Also, it's discouraging fibroblast or um, scar tissue growth. So it helps in a few different ways. So there were two clinical trials in this. Um, the first trial went for one year. The second one looked more at efficacy at two years. So if you take microfracture alone, and shown in the red, it starts degrading at about 12 months. And this has been um, seen in the literature. It was also seen in our patients. But when we have that hydrogel in there to help um, sort of redirect that healing process, the cartilage is more robust and lasts longer. One thing we noticed is that um, in this trial, the cartilage repair trial, we were redirecting the wound healing process. So the biomaterial wasn't serving as the three-dimensional framework for new tissue growth, um, but it was, it was redirecting that wound healing process. We also had another uh, clinical trial that we were looking at for um, soft tissue fillers. And we did a, a clinical trial where we made the implants and um, it was in patients that were going to have a tummy tuck procedure, uh, but three months before they got that implant. So then we could get the biomaterial back. And we noticed some interesting things. Depending on which tissue the same biomaterial was adjacent to, whether it be subcutaneous muscle, adipose, um, or dermis, the immune cells were different, right? So there was a tissue-specific um, immune response to the same material. So this got us really interested into looking at the immune system um, and maybe rethinking the biomaterial response and maybe what was sort of the first target we could use to promote tissue repair. So um, I went on sabbatical to Switzerland. Um, thankfully, um, Jeff Hubble and Melody Swartz um, welcomed me to um, the EPFL there. And so I got to at least learn a little bit of a language. Immunology is not easy. Um, and then when I came back to Hopkins, little did I know that right next to me in the, in the buildings adjacent to me, there was the cancer immunotherapy folks who were really um, doing groundbreaking work in that area. So while they were focusing on dissociating tumors and looking at what immune cells were there, we could apply those same techniques to dissociating um, tissue spaces where wounds and biomaterials were implanted to understand um, what, what was going on in the repair process. So the immune system is interesting in tissue repair. Sometimes it helps and sometimes it hurts. So um, I have some clips of papers here um, that show how you know, these cells are required. Macrophages are known to be required for um, um, tissue repair. But um, there are things that associate with negative tissue repair, whether it be CD8 T cells or certain immune signatures in the blood that can predict a fast or a slow recovery. Now, in the case of um, tissues such as um, muscle, it was found that type 2 signals, immune signals, were important. I'll be talking about that first. Type 2 signals being characterized by interleukin-4. So an immune response is not always bad, and this was a little bit uh, different from our thinking of biomaterials. So early on, biomaterials were supposed to hide um, and be stealth. And then when we started looking at putting stem cells in there or um, promoting tissue repair, we wanted to have a positive sort of interaction with the surrounding tissue and cells. And here finally, we're moving to, well, we want the immune system to recognize what we're doing here, um, but we need to be specific about how it recognizes what's going on. So before we get into that, I did want to review quickly some of the um, basic immune classes that I'll be talking about. So um, there's the innate and the adaptive immune system and different cell types in each. So the innate immune system is a fast responder, but generally less specific. So um, cell types that are gonna be important here are neutrophils and macrophages. Um, and then there's the adaptive immune system, which might take a little bit longer, but it's very specific. So um, you'll have antigen presenting cells that are presenting um, signals and antigens to um, things like T cells and B cells. And um, we'll be talking a lot about T cells um, and maybe another time about B cells. Um, then there's some interesting cells that live uh, sort of on, on the line between the two innate lymphocytes. As the name suggests, they have innate-like behaviors, but they derive from lymphocyte lineage. Um, um, and then there's the gamma delta T cells, which um, I won't talk about too much today, but we've um, published some interesting things on gamma delta T cells in the foreign body response. So all these different cell types are um, not only there, um, they're communicating and working together. And so by the end of the um, presentation, I hope I'll be able to get across to you how um, all these cells are communicating and working together to sort of make a tissue sort of e either a healing or non-healing environment. 
So in addition to the cell types, there are certain phenotypes. So I mentioned type 2 immune response, and this is characterized by production of the cytokine interleukin-4 and others such as IL-5 and 13. They can be made by a number of cell types, um, eosinophils, innate lymphocytes, and T cells that are expressing IL-4 are called Th2 T cells. Now, I always like looking at what the sort of um, normal classical function of these cells are. So um, these cells were associated with um, host defense, like most cell in the immune system, um, but in particular parasites and helminths um, and extracellular um, bugs. Um, it's also associated with allergy and asthma. Um, so some negative sequelae of that to host defense. Um, and then finally, um, I'll show you some evidence, and there's also much published literature on the importance of um, these cells in tissue repair, in particular the liver and the muscle. So another group that I'll be talking about are type 17, or type 3 immune responses, characterized by the production of IL-17, um, different forms of it, ANF. And these are made by gamma delta cells, again, the innate lymphocytes, and um, T cells expressing IL-17 are called Th17 cells. Again, um, these are associated with um, certain types of host defense. Um, and the negative sequelae of this pathway is um, autoimmunity. So um, type IL-17 is associated with a number of autoimmune diseases, and also fibrosis. So um, that makes sense with um, the foreign body response that this would be important. Um, so let's get back to tissue repair now. So um, as we were shifting to try to understand the immune system and how we might want to therapeutically target it to promote tissue repair, um, we first wanted to look at, well, what is the natural immune response um, after tissue injury? Um, and what does it look like in a healing wound? And how is that similar or different to uh, a non-healing wound characterized by fibrosis and chronic inflammation? And can we use this information to shift that non-healing wound, resolve things, and um, redirect it to tissue healing? So the model tissues that I'll be, going, I'll be talking about today are muscle tissue. So, you know, we're constantly damaging our muscle if, um, for example, we're exercising. Um, of course, if you get a very large defect, you're going to need extra help to, um, to fix it. But in general, um, it's a little damage to the, to the um, uh, muscle tissue can, can be repaired. That's opposed to cartilage that I mentioned before, and the reason why it was uh, an important tissue engineering target. It doesn't have much um, capacity for repair. Now, there are some biomaterials that can um, help model or even exaggerate these environments. Um, so I'll be talking about biological scaffolds, um, some of which are used clinically. Um, and then synthetic materials I won't talk to you um, about today. We're just going to talk more about the um, cartilage environment. So in order to understand these responses, we want to um, really map the responses here. So defining tissue-specific injury and biomaterial response when we're using that as a, as a model. So we want to understand who was there, what are they doing, and who's talking to who, right? So what, what I'll show you then is you can have the same cell types there, but the way they're talking to each other is different, and that results in a different outcome in the repair process. So we've taken these cell types individually and um, isolated them and then also looked at them all together, trying to characterize um, who's there. And we hope these tissue maps will be useful for designing therapies, targeting therapies, but also relevant to um, a number of tissue pathologies broadly. So um, we'll be using a variety of techniques. So um, flow cytometry, standard immunology for many years is just growing and growing and growing. So the number of cell markers that you can look at um, are just you know, it's constantly increasing. Um, and of course, um, single cell technologies are an exciting area. And then even some traditional areas such as bulk sequencing, sorting and sequencing specific cell types can be very helpful for rare populations um, and just confirming, um, confirming uh, results. So starting off with the muscle wound, um, Caitlin Sadler, who's now at um, NIH, started putting biological scaffolds into these materials. So, Biological scaffolds um, had already been shown to operate by an immunological aspect, so macrophages were important for the therapeutic response. These are also used clinically and um, considered to be pro-regenerative. So um, we implanted a scaffold in um, quadricep defects, so we take a punch in there and take a, um, a large um, amount of the um, uh, quadriceps out, and what we can see is an increase in interleukin-4 production. So I mentioned interleukin-4 was important for tissue repair, um, and, and we could um, um, increase that with the scaffold in there. 
Now, you might have a question about scaffold composition. We did evaluate a number of different sources of um, that tissue extracellular matrix. Um, so you can use small intestinal submucosa, bladder, um, urinary bladder matrix, um, bone matrix, um, even cardiac tissue matrix. And you can um, pretty much get the same biological outcomes depending on the source. Um, you might just process them differently for different applications, whether you want particulates or powder or sheet. So um, if we implant these biological scaffolds, um, if we do f first a characterization of the myeloid populations, um, and the labels here are down with the different colors, but you can just broadly look, there are different cell types there, right? So the muscle injury alone, we've got those um, cell types, a lot of macrophages, we have different ways to characterize macrophages. Um, and then if we have the scaffold in there, first of all, we have um, um, a lot of eosinophils, uh, but then also these scaffold-associated macrophages that are a little bit different than your standard macrophages. Now, if we look at the standard markers for macrophages, um, these are rather classical, the 86 pro-inflammatory and um, surface marker CD206 being more pro-regenerative or alternatively activated uh, macrophages. So the scaffold decreases the pro-inflammatory macrophage uh, marker expression on the surface of cells. It doesn't change too much with 206, except for one scaffold that induced more fibrosis. But here, I want you to look at the flow pod. This is 206 and 86. The majority of the cell types, so that macrophages, express both, right? So it's, they're, they're present um, together, it's just the ratio of one to another. And um, I'll talk later about um, how we've used single cell to get better surface markers to characterize really what's happening with the macrophages. Um, now let's look at the um, adaptive immune response. So we noticed that CD4 um, T cells are increasing. So CD4 T cells are the, uh, considered the T helper cells that secrete cytokines, including um, interleukin-4. So if we look at the wound alone, which is treated just with saline water versus the wound with the ECM biological scaffold, um, early on, um, we get um, interferon gamma and you know, also IL-17 being expressed by um, the CD4 T cells, um, but IL-4 then tends to take over and increase with time, um, again, moving things towards resolution and regeneration. Now, if we look at that IL-4 a little bit more, um, this is with a mouse that has GFP connected to IL-4. Again, we can see um, you have a little bit in the wound alone, but when you put in that scaffold, it essentially gives a power boost to that Th2 T cells. You get more of them and you get more expression of the interleukin-4. Now, um, I showed you already what happened to macrophages. Now, if we do not have T cells there, so if we take away those T cells, those macrophages, shown here in red then, in the rag knockout animal, increase significantly their expression of that pro-inflammatory macrophage sur surface marker, um, and we lose the um, um, CD206. So double whammy, more inflammation and less resolution. Now, Kayla noticed something very interesting. She picked up that draining lymph node and noticed that when there was an implant, um, it was larger, and you also got interleukin-4 expression there. So this was particularly interesting because um, of two things. Number one, it means that the local injury, the local implant, could be having systemic effects, regional and systemic effects. And that also introduces the possibility that systemic aspects of the organism can impact the local response to whatever is going on, whether it be a wound or a material. Now to probe a little bit more that T cell response, um, Jonathan Powell um, um, had Richter knockout mice and we could take the rag knockout mouse and put either normal T cells in or T cells that were deficient in the Richter protein, which is a part of the TORC2 complex, which is critical for TH2 differentiation. So um, the cells, the T cells in those mice could not differentiate. And so um, what we found is you can see um, there's um, additional fibrosis and adipogenesis instead of the nice repair tissue. So those T cells um, were important in directing those macrophages, but it also, again, um, makes, the, makes the point that the innate and the adaptive immune system are working together, talking to each other. So um, back to um, looking at some um, more cell types. So um, we have been exploring um, single cell techniques. So I mentioned um, the macrophage diversity. Um, we pull out macrophages and run single cell, and we essentially have a better definition now of um, different macrophage subsets, ones that are more fibrotic and ones that are more regenerative. 
And we've also done that with fibroblasts. So there's a lot of exciting work going on in um, fibroblasts, but um, we're particularly interested in the immunological rule. So we have lots of different cells talking to each other. Um, in, um, in, in not just the immune, traditional immune cells, but also sort of the tissue resident fibroblasts. So we have a macrophage data set here, we have a fibroblast data set here, um, and we also took um, CD45 enriched um, single cell data sets. So a lot of different cell types, um, a lot of different cell types here. And um, we, we first you know, ran the single cell, and you can see that there are many different clusters, many different cell types. Um, and when we compared the, the cluster composition between groups, um, you know, if we, these different treatment groups, whether it be the biological scaffold, the wound, or no injury, we don't see huge differences, right? We don't see the same differences we would expect based on the different biomaterial implants. So um, we looked at um, building a program. Chris Cherry built a program that um, does an estimate of how cells are talking to each other. And there are a few programs out there, but he, he went about it in a different way, looking first at transcription factor activation and then looking at how that correlated with certain receptors that were signaling. And this is important because a lot of times we don't catch the expression of ligands. So for example, eosinophils making IL-4 are gonna be hard to capture with single cell, but we can capture the receptor and the activation of pathways associated with IL-4 and the transcription factor activation. So this domino program does this in an unbiased way, so it's independent of the clusters that you normally see with um, single cell data sets. And um, so this is what it looks like when we have sort of a pro-regenerative muscle environment versus a fibrotic muscle environment. So you can see the communication pathways are pretty different. And then we can look at, well, what are the specific activation, um, transcription factor activations in a healing versus a non-healing wound? Um, and this is what it looks like. Now, what's interesting is that um, you have an immune module and tissue-specific module. So in the tissue-specific modules where I would put things like stem cells, um, and then we have a fibroblast module. And the way they communicate is, is different, and we have some um, particular um, predictive receptors and transcription factor activation that you can look at and then probe further um, using this program. So um, this is gonna be important when we look at um, that um, non-healing wound, in particular, looking at those non-immune cells um, that are immunologically active. So when we're trying to make um, cartilage, um, I showed you data that you know, a focal cartilage defect, um, which is generally more of an athletic or trauma injury, and if you're in a healthy environment, um, you can get some decent repair. But most of the patients who need cartilage repair have more of a diffuse degeneration connected with chronic inflammation, right? So you do have um, an immune component. So um, what we found is when we put um, um, these cells from an arthritic environment um, or expose them to cytokines like interleukin-1 beta, you decrease tissue production, right? So that immune part was important. At the same time, um, we found um, in collaboration with Unity that senescent cells are um, present in OA. So that had been published for a, a while, and we looked at sort of, well, what is the real active component of these cells, and are they causative in arthritis? So what is a senescent cell? So senescence uh, was first discovered by Hayflick in the context of replicative senescence. Um, and then later, um, telomere reduction and sort of cells um, um, wearing out um, is another area that um, is important with senescence. As the cells get older and can't proliferate anymore, the telomeres reduce. Then you also have stress-induced or pure um, premature senescence. So oxidative stress, um, oncogenic stress, um, and what I'll show you, immunological stress can um, induce senescence. So just like the immune system, Sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad. So Judy Campisi showed how senescent cells are important for wound healing. And she characterized that fibroblasts and endothelial cells were the primary senescent cells there. And um, you needed them to get um, efficient repair. Um, and then I'll talk to you though how chronic senescence or um, having senescent cells around too long that don't get cleared actually inhibit regeneration. So what are senescent cells and how do they operate? So they are in proliferative arrest, so they are no longer dividing, but they are far from quiescent. They're actually quite active and they secrete a senescence-associated secretory phenotype, or SAST. 
So the SASP is implicated in their pathologies um, in promoting tumors or various age-related diseases such as heart disease, of course arthritis, um, and diabetes. But then, as I mentioned, there are positive factors in tissue repair. So we first used the mouse model developed by Judy, where you had um, a P16 promoter connected to um, something that allows us to visualize um, the cells, but then also a kill switch with the gans so we could selectively um, clear those P16 positive cells. So when we made a joint injury, um, and um, a joint injury, uh, sham just opening up the joint, um, so very mild injury versus um, an ACL transaction, and this is a vehicle, um, you can see an increase in senescent cells, um, or the bioluminescence at least. Um, and then if we give canciclovir and kill those senescent cells, we can get rid of them. So this is a nice model to see, well, okay, is it, are these senescent cells just correlating with disease or are they causative? So if we use that genetic model or some drugs, what we notice is that when we clear senescent cells after that injury, we significantly decrease that inflammation. Um, you can look at a number of factors that are um, suspected um, SAS factors, interleukin-1 beta, interleukin-6, um, a lot of MMPs. Um, and then you can also look at functional outcomes such as pain. So if you remove those senescent cells, not only do you reduce inflammation, but you also reduce pain. Um, and then surprisingly, we, we, we saw that when you did clear those senescent cells, you got better tissue repair. So you could get resolution. So um, this, I think, is important because we're not giving any growth factors. We're not giving any stem cells. We're just removing inhibitory factors that are blocking the tissue repair process. So ultimately, clear senescent cells and various SAS factors, um, and you can reduce the senescence-associated secretory phenotype, which includes a lot of inflammatory factors, reduce pain, and increase tissue repair. We were quite interested in some of these um, SAS factors, such as IL-6 and IL-1 beta, because as we look at how things might be communicating, um, these factors are actually known to promote um, cell differentiation, immune cell differentiation down particular pathways. In particular, IL-6, IL-1 beta in the presence of TGF beta induces um, a type 3 or that type 17, um, interleukin 17 mediated um, immune response. So we went back to the joints and looked for that, and what we found was, in particular, um, um, CD4 and gamma delta expression of IL-17, A and F increased significantly with um, um, that ACL injury. So IL-17 was also secreted by things like innate lymphocytes. So a number of different cell types are all making that IL-17. Now, that's a trauma. And um, osteoarthritis is considered a local disease, just wear and tear um, um, and the joints wearing out. Um, but just like the muscle, where I said we looked at that um, draining lymph node, we also looked at the draining lymph node here. And what we found was really a significant increase in um, both the general gene expression and also specific cell types. This is the CD4 T cells making IL-17 or TH17 cells increasing significantly in the lymph node. So particularly in the joint, which doesn't have a lot of vascularity, you don't have too many immune cells there, that um, draining lymph node provided almost a magnification of what was going on and we could really see these immunological changes very nicely. So what happens with the senolytic? So um, again, this is making that connection between the senescent cells, fibroblasts, and the IL-17 immune cells. What we found is when we delivered that senolytic, um, this is looking in the lymph node, you can significantly reduce the signatures of um, IL-17. So this, this is um, um, very exciting because it's a way that we can um, make a connection between the two. And if we neutralize IL-17, um, we can decrease expression of um, factors connected with senescence. So in particular, P16, and this is P21. So we went in vitro to validate this a little bit more, and this is what we found. So if we artificially induce senescence using um, irradiation um, and expose those cells in vitro to naive T cells, activate those T cells and put it in the presence of TGF beta, we get a significant increase in IL-17. Now, vice versa, if we take TH17 cells and co-culture them next to healthy fibroblasts, we can induce senescence in those fibroblasts as seen by a number of SAS factors and increase in P16. 
And if we look at the expression profile of these cells, um, it's, it's quite different. This inflammatory induced senescence is, is, um, has different um, characteristics um, compared to the um, standard um, classical ways of looking at senescence with um, oxidative damage. So um, one important factor though is can we still repair when old? Right, so many people coming in with that joint degeneration um, are not, you know, 10 week, 12 week uh, mice. So, um, actually, reviewers asked us this first, and um, Jan van Dersen has published a paper using another mouse model, um, clearing senescent cells and looking um, across lifespan. And so I asked him, well, do you have any joints left? He didn't look at the joints, and thankfully he had a few joints left, and what we saw was amazing. So when you cleared the senescent cells, he had this beautiful cartilage. And without that, you can, you can barely see where the joint space was. Now, if we looked at the senolytic just in wild-type animals, um, you first you see before surgery, those joints are not looking so great. Um, and the injury makes it look even worse. And the senolytic doesn't really do too much. You can decrease, infl decrease inflammatory markers, but um, you don't see much tissue repair. Now, another collaborator, Dao Zhao, had um, been focusing on the bone marrow and understanding um, senescence in the bone marrow and how you can rejuvenate the bone marrow. And one thing we noticed in the old animals, um, if you look at the CD4 T cells in the lymph node, there are not so many of them, right? So you, you really um, don't have too many T cells left in the lymph node um, um, as, as you age. So um, we looked at um, using the local senolytic, like we did with the young animals, and then um, also the systemic senolytic that Dahong used to rejuvenate the bone marrow. And uh, this is what we saw. So again, IL-17 going down um, with senolytic in the young animals, um, but in the old animals, we could also get IL-17 going down. Okay, not a big deal. But what was different was interleukin-4, that same cytokine that was important for muscle. So when we gave that combined intraarticular and systemic senolytic, that was the only time we got an increase in interleukin-4 in the joint in old animals and saw a nice cartilage repair. So um, you can repair when old, but you're probably going to need some help. You're going to need some additional um, senolytic and or additional um, addressing of these systemic immunological changes, um, which I'll show you um, um, finally in muscle. So this was in clinical testing by Unity. Um, they tested um, phase one, looked good, um, and they saw a nice correlation, correlation actually in phase zero between senescence markers and severity of disease. Phase one and phase two, um, but a little tricky part here, um, they did a single injection um, and patients went up to 85 years old. So what I didn't tell you in our regimen was we did multiple daily injections um, and you actually needed at least three injections um, every other day. Um, so that dose really was important. Um, and then I showed you the aging. So um, P16 in older animals represented here by A is a lot higher. So the dosing matters and then the patient population. So this brings some more questions and, you know, can regenerative therapy still work in aging? Um, and this, um, we, we did the cartilage work, just um, came out last year, and now we've got some work in the muscle, which um, I'll post as a preprint, hopefully pretty soon. Uh, but this is exciting because I was quite intrigued by this paper from a number of years ago that either, you know, with aging, the muscle stem cell population is still there, but it's not really functioning. But if you take it out and restore it, it can actually function again, right? So the stem cells were there, but there are things just blocking them. So again, thinking of the inhibitory factors of senescence, what are all these things that are sort of blocking tissue repair? So we use that same muscle injury model, the same biological scaffolds. What happens in an older animals? Well, I know there's a lot of data here, but the main factors are, we saw with aging, eosinophils and CD4 T cells decrease. Okay, so this is um, um, high parametric um, flow cytometry, looking at young and old animals. Um, and here, if we pick out a few pieces here, so these are the CD4 T cells. Um, increase, I showed you that in young animals, not the same increase in old animals. And on the other hand, CD8 cells increase. So CD8 cells are the ones secreting usually pro-inflammatory factors. Um, so 
a reduction of the helper cells, an increase in the pro-inflammatory cells, and then our eosinophil numbers um, going down. So the CD4 T cells and the eosinophils were important in making IL-4. So um, we did single cell again, and um, just like I showed you with Domino, um, we didn't have a large number of samples per group. It's pretty expensive. And so if you just look at differential expression and clusters between the young and the old, you don't see much. But we can use techniques such as this non-negative matrix factorization. And we found that markers of collagens are higher in the old, so more fibrosis-related things in the old. And um, in the younger animals, you have more macrophage activation and antigen presentation. Okay, and then when we apply domino to that cell interaction, we see some really interesting differences. So um, again, these are the different modules talking to each other. So this is unbiased and you just group together um, the, the cell types that seem to be interacting together. So you have your immune tissue, fibroblasts, and then antigen presenting module. Well, lots of connection here in the young animals. But look, we're losing connection in the old animals. In particular, this fibroblast module is really off on its own. Um, so we're really dysfunctional in some cell communication. Now, um, Jin Han, who worked on this, um, looked, did some um, string analysis to look at protein-protein interactions to see what was going on. And this predicted that IL-17 signaling increased only with injury in the aging environment. And this was pretty neat because if you just compare the young and the old, with these various cytokines that were predicted with this analysis, um, you don't see a difference. It was only after that injury that the old animals had this um, crazy response. And um, so we looked at this a little bit further. So um, again, looking at the interleukin-4 and IL-17. So um, IL-17F in the muscle tissue is another example of one of the factors that only went up with, um, with treatment. And gamma-delta um, T cells were an important component that was making um, IL-17. So if we look at just general gene expression, you see IL-17F, if we do flow cytometry and staining for um, IL-17A, you can see it in the gamma-deltas increasing. So, um, oh, did I forget the most important key part? <laughs> Sorry, there's one slide. This is, this is new data that just came out. So um, what we can do then is actually give a neutralizing antibody to IL-17 and recover some of that therapeutic response. So really, this type of analysis gives you new therapeutic targets um, to, to look at. Um, and I really believe that we will be needing combination therapies. We've got all these different cell types um, communicating, working together. You've got environments changing, such as the aged environment. There's no way uh, a single therapy is going to work in both the young and the old, and we're going to need these combination therapies, whether it be um, a senolytic, systemic, and local, or um, an immune factor along with biological, um, the biological scaffold. So what is this approach, this concept of regenerative immunology? So we are connecting together regenerative medicine, immunology, and tissue engineering. Um, but there's still a lot to do to map this immune response to injury. So um, people have studied the innate response for um, a pretty good amount of time, but the adaptive response um, is quite interesting, and we're now pursuing um, sort of antigen specificity um, and, um, and even a memory of these injuries and um, even biomaterial implantations um, and a lot of clinical samples coming from that. Um, so a lot to do for mapping this, um, these immune responses and then understanding how those immune environments impact downstream tissue repair, including things like stem cell activation, um, sort of cell types like fibroblasts and senescence, how it might affect vascularization, things like that, and then use this information to engineer immunotherapies um, to create a pro-regenerative environment. So whether it be a cell, ther th cell therapy, um, neutralizing antibodies, or small molecule senolytics, or biological scaffolds, um, we can use the information from this mapping and communication um, in the different tissue environments to promote tissue repair. And as my cancer immunology collab uh, collaborators like to say, the immune system is therapeutically accessible, so it makes it a nice target um, for regenerative medicine. So many people to thank, um, um, lab members, both current and alumni involved in this work, um, collaborators at the Bloomberg Kimball Institute for Cancer Immunotherapy, um, and our computational collaborators as we've moved into the single cell space, um, senescence uh, collaborators, and of course, um, our clinical collaborators um, who are helping us with um, clinical samples. So with that, um, thank you for the invitation to speak today, and um, thank you for your time.
That, that was terrific, Jennifer. Thanks so much and very stimulating. So uh, if anybody has any questions, please just put it into the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Uh, they're starting to come in, and interestingly, they're a mix of, uh, of both uh, very specific and also very philosophical. So maybe I'll alternate, be <laughs> alternate between them. Um, the first question is, are uh, CD4 T cells, do they make immune synapses with any of the macrophages, and is the CD4 reaction specific to any particular antigen that might be presented? Fantastic questions. So um, one, um, I didn't mention what the sca scaffold-associated macrophage looked like. So when I showed the myeloid reactions um, to the scaffold, I had the, those dark blue scaffold-associated macrophages. Those are um, co-expressing CD11B and CD11C. Um, and our MHC2 high. So it does suggest they are doing some antigen presentation. So I think it does make sense, particularly if you think of tissue damage and all the pieces that need to be cleaned up with tissue, uh, tissue um, um, damage, that there would be some antigen presentation. Um, and actually, we also do see some tertiary lymphoid structures. Right where you have um, um, macrophages, T cells, and B cells, so you, you see those um, ter tertiary lymphoid structures. But the real thing is that your last question is um, the antigen-specific T cells. So two pieces. Um, number one, um, we are doing, we are in the process of doing TCR analysis with single cell data sets. So I will have information on clones um, next time, right? Hopefully, hopefully not too long. So um, there are, you know, we're pursuing understanding that clonal, clonal response. More specific data that, um, that we have is in Liam Chung's um, Science Translational Medicine paper. Um, and it was specific to the foreign body response, but I think is relevant for tissue repair. So he made a bone marrow chimera of um, wild-type bone marrow and marrow from an OT2 mouse. That OT2 mouse can only respond to ovalbumin. So we were curious, would you see that same increase in IL-17, in this case associated with fibrosis foreign body response around a material? And essentially, your wild-type mice um, increased our IL-17 production in CD4 T cells. Um, and then in the OT2 mice, you do not see any upregulation in IL-17, right? There's no ovalbumin there. There's, um, so there does not appear to any, be any nonspecific activation of those T cells. So I do think it is going to be antigen specific and we will have TCR clones and um, we're trying to figure it out. So excited. excited. Great, thank you. Well, some, some of the questions are actually skewing a, a bit more philosophical, but I'll, I'll just... I'm curious what a philosophical question could be. <laughs> well, this, it, it's meta. It's given that um, the initial uh, reaction clinically to most injuries, particularly in the musculoskeletal system, is to give anti-inflammatory agents, NSAIDs, steroids, things of that sort, and you're findings that uh, kind of inflammation is Janus face. It does some good things and some bad things. What are you feeling about what standard of care is most of the time for orthopedists? Um, that's a great question. So I think um, uh, Steve Badalak did publish that um, looking at the response to a biological scaffold and NSAIDs, uh, suggesting that you would get some um, reduction in the therapeutic response of that biomaterial with the NSAIDs. Um, how, you know, however, with regular injuries, um, I think it's, I think it's a good question. I think there should be some data out there on that, um, published at least for, um, from the physical therapy sort of exercise training perspective. Um, but if you think though about the joint where it's not a good immune response, right? So you've got not the cell types that you generally want, you can imagine an anti-inflammatory would be helpful. We did do an experiment in the cartilage of um, a steroid injection um, in addition to the um, um, senolytic. And what we did notice is that it did block all the immune cells, even the ones that were making interleukin-10, which for, increases for the sham surgery and seems to promote repair. So um, I think that is consistent also with uh, clinical data that steroids tend to lead to further joint degeneration. So yes, I think we need to be smarter about our inflammatory targeting. Great. Okay. Uh, first of all, complimented on terrific work. 
which with Thank which you. I agree. And did Thank you, you. <laughs> did you expect almost complete reduction in interleukins with the removal of the senescent cells? Aren't there other cell types contributing to interleukin levels? Absolutely. And this is just a snapshot in time. So I think the senolytic is going to be um, temporary, first of all, right? Um, so if we look further along after um, the senolytic treatment, await further time points, you see the increased joint degeneration. So um, yes, um, there are other cell types besides T cells. Um, we're also looking at co-culture of senescent cells and macrophages, lots going on there. and. A lot of times when you clear out a T cell, innate lymphocytes can compensate for the cytokine production. Um, and we did show that innate lymphocytes are, are making that. So you might have a temporary reduction in the cytokines, um, and it's not completely um, zero with the, the cytokines, but um, I think the presence of those cytokines are gonna induce more senescence, right? It's a positive feed forward. So you need to address both that stromal and inflammatory cell or senescent cell in addition to the immune inflammatory cell. So another argument for combination therapies, which I think presents a unique challenge from the clinical trial perspective and regulatory perspective, because combination therapies um, are gonna be challenging. <laughs> I certainly agree, and, and your last comment almost is identical to the end of my talks as well. <laughs> the, the regulatory hurdles that combined therapies have to, uh, have to circumvent. The next question actually uh, starts dealing with the difference between your mouse models and actual human systems. And uh, it, there are significant variations in the gamma delta T cell populations between mice and humans. For example, yep. the homotypic receptor dendritic GDT cells in the mouse epidermis has no equivalent in humans. Have your wound repair studies been correlated in humans vis-a-vis -vis your mouse models? And also, great presentation. <laughs> Thank you very much, and that's a fantastic question. So I will point you to Liam Chung's um, Science Translational Medicine paper on IL-17 and senescence um, in the foreign body response. And there we're able to get a lot of clinical samples from breast implants or essentially the expanders, um, tissue expanders that are placed before the permanent implant. We get those exchange, we, we, we get that tissue sample when those are being exchanged and we can get the cells out of that. And there is where we see a lot of the gamma delta T cell, much more. So when we show this data to our immunology collaborators, they're like, wow, what an incredible number of gamma delta cells there. And that's just in that tissue around the breast implant, right? So not where you'd expect to have a ton of gamma deltas. So I think we're gonna be finding new function of gamma delta cells. And just as I mentioned, we have that um, TCR analysis from single cell data sets in, in the mice coming. We're also doing that with the human samples. So we're going to, um, and try to look at the antigen specificity of that in addition to the um, um, understanding more about the gamma delta cells um, in, in the clinical samples. So um, yes, um, they're very different in the skin. I don't know where they're coming from in this tissue sample, right? Um, in our, again, this is um, a different scenario in the mouse studies. Um, when we put in a gut infection that induces IL-17 in the gut, we see more gamma deltas in the lymph node, the draining lymph node from those implants. So um, I think they are potentially giving an environment, uh, acting as an environmental sensor um, and impacting um, what's going on in the local tissue um, in, in that way. But that's another one for, I think it's a super exciting area. Um, they are there in human samples and we're trying to figure, that, what, figure out what they're doing. Besides making IL-17 ANF. <laughs> All right, this is a more. This is one of the more philosophical questions, given uh, given the use not just in unregulated clinics, but even in some orthopedic departments, the use of MSC therapy injections for arthritic joints and things of that sort. Have you formulated based on your work an opinion about those? Well, I would say I had an opinion even of Condex um, when I was in graduate school. Condex, or, or sorry, that's that was our product, C Cardicel. So the autologous <laughs> chondrocyte implants, right? Um, you know, what I had always sort of thought somewhere that, you know, we're delivering dead cells. Okay, and what's interesting is that 
there are papers now that are being published, right, um, of applying them to cardiac injuries, and I think another one came out recently too, that essentially dead MSCs, right, are um, the injection of those stem cells, a lot of them dying, actually can give you a pro-regenerative immunological response, right? So I talked about tissue damage, right? And damage associated molecular patterns that can induce an immune response. Um, ton of, tons of them get stuck in the spleen, right? An um, immunological organ. I mean, not for the intra-articular injections, um, but just the idea that a dead cell can have a therapeutic impact. So I'm not making a judgment, right, that, you know, but <laughs> I'm just saying that um, a dead cell, especially if you have like millions of them, um, can have a significant therapeutic impact, right? Are you mobilizing more immune cells, changing the immune phenotype? So um, there, I can imagine many mechanistic scenarios where that could lead to some outcome. How's that? <laughs> um. In your experiments, when you injected a uh, synolytic, uh, did you see, presumably that was systemic, did you see any impact on other organs other than the musculoskeletal system, for example, heart or brain, or, or did you not have an opportunity to look at those organs? So um, for the young animals, we injected the senolytic locally into the joint intraarticular. And then the older animals, we did the systemic, um, um, systemic senolytic naviticlax that Dao Hung had published. So he published, he focused mostly on the bone marrow um, and the changes that happen in the bone marrow. So um, essentially with aging, the bone marrow becomes um, more myeloid skewed. Right, so you can look at sort of lymphocyte um, replenishment in, in the marrow and sort of rejuvenation of the marrow, making it, having it look more young, per se. And, um, you know, periodically we have looked at kidney and liver and lung senescence, um, and usually with these systemic senolytics, um, they will decrease, um, but we use the same regimen as Dao Hong, so we didn't, we didn't spend too much time um, analyzing that. That said, I think the bone marrow is really important as a place where you have some memory of um, injury or some, some aspect. And I point to um, one of my favorite papers recently is Catherine Moore's paper looking at cardiac myocardial infarction and breast tumor growth. And um, the, you know that tissue injury in the heart impacting tumor growth in a distal site and they found that epigenetic changes in the bone marrow monocytes were in part responsible for that, and it could be transferred to another animal. So I just think that's amazing. And so um, I think it's incredible to think that you know, some injury or implant in the body, you can have a memory of that imprinted in your bone marrow. That's philosophical, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so we're getting towards the end of the hour. And, and the last question, it is, it is a bit philosophical, so we'll make that the, the last question. Uh, given pointing out that, given uh, that you indicated that uh, senescent cells also seem to be a bit Janus-faced and that they have, for example, as you pointed out, Judy Campisi talks about their positive impact, and uh, I, I think I know where you're going to come down on this. Is it that uh, that the senescent cells, as they become senescent, stop producing good things, or do they start producing toxic things? So we do have some data on this, and I'm trying to, we're, we're working to get this um, paper, paper together. Um, and so I think we've started defining the good and the bad senescent cell. And um, so we've done that using a transfer learning technique where um, we can get bulk, uh, bulk signatures of um, a senescent cell by sorting out specific populations from a transgenic that allows us to label them bright enough. And we can do the flow cytometry to understand which cell types are senescent and then sort them out specifically and do bulk sequencing. Take that bulk sequencing signature and apply it to single cell to understand which clusters are most similar to those senescent cells, because you can't capture senescence in single cell for a variety of reasons. 
um, that I don't have time to get into, but it's hard to see them there. And so we have some clusters that we think are associated both with the um, um, looking at sort of the um, signatures of those clusters and then fish to see where they are. We think some of them are associated specifically with angiogenesis, and some of them, senescent cells with a different phenotype, are associated with um, more of, actually, they have a cartilage-like phenotype, but they're in, the, they're in the area of fibrosis. So I think there are different types of senescent cells, and we are going to learn which ones are good and bad. There's probably a kinetics, right? So how long they stick around, if they're being, oh well, if if they're reversible or being cleared, um, but I think there are different ones and we will be defining the good and the bad and then we can develop really good drugs, right? So keep the good ones, but get rid of the bad ones. That's the dream. <laughs> anyway, one last breaking question came in that's not so philosophical, so we'll end maybe on that one. Uh, okay. Fantastic presentation, and could you please comment on the potential impact of extracellular matrix on stem cell senescence in vitro? So the extracellular matrix scaffolds well. on stem cell senescence? Probably. I, I, I suppose you can broaden it. Is there uh, any, any relevance to the substrate that's that either they're grown on or what you might encounter in situ. Yeah, so in vitro, you don't have the immune aspect, right? So then you're depending on ECM factors in, in you know, specific factors in the ECM, whether they be, as Steve Badalek talks about, the matrix-bound vesicles that have important factors in them um, or certain ECM components that can help proliferation. But what I think is interesting also is potentially in the cultures clearing the senescent cells as you move forward, because essentially those senescent cells that are left there can spread senescence or cause trouble with the other cells, and it's sort of a domino effect, right? So if you can be culturing them, and as you go, you know, work to clear those senescent cells, um, I, I think you'll be able to keep your healthy ones healthier longer. Yeah, that's a great answer. It gets into a whole other territory of, yes. of you know, the, the, the senile brain that we don't have time to get into. <laughs> but uh, uh, so thank you so much. We've come to the end of the hour. In fact, we've gone over. You've been very generous with your time, and it was a terrific and, and stimulating presentation. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Have a good rest of your day. Bye-bye. Thank you very Bye -bye. much.